Give me the camera. Give, give it to me. Give it off. Give it off. Give down, it. Down. Down. Give it. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull was perhaps never not going to be controversial, making a new sequel to one of the most beloved franchises of all time 20 years after it had last appeared in theaters was an audacious move on the part of George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Harrison Ford. As the story goes, Spielberg and Ford both resisted the idea of doing an alien-themed indie film for years before finally caving in when they realized that their window of opportunity was closing, what with Ford pushing 70. This ain't gonna be easy. Not as easy as it used to be. Whether they were motivated by nostalgia or desire or the realization that hundreds of millions of dollars were at stake, they forged ahead with the project, which of course resulted in 2008's Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. A flawed film that is perhaps better than many other action adventures, but much, much worse than what you would expect from Indiana Jones. As such, it's the latest entry into Screen's Half Good series. Crystal Skull updates the action to 1957, in the midst of the Red Scare, and thus replaces Nazis with communists. To peer across the world and know the enemy's secrets. To place our thoughts into the minds of your leaders. Improbably enough, said communists seem to be able to travel all over America without raising any suspicions, despite the fact that they have the most comical Russian accents you've ever heard outside of the hunt for Red October. Uh, we will do this, what is the expression? Old fashioned way. <laughs> Before you know it, nukes are going off, crystal skulls are being stolen and re-stolen and stolen again, and Indy and his son are off on a journey across South America in an attempt to save not only Indy's old friend Oxley, but also his long-lost love, Marion Ravenwood. Indiana Jones. <laughs> About time you showed up. Mom! Sweetheart. Mom. What follows is a fairly haphazardly plotted film, and the blame for its shortcomings seem to be evenly spread among all parties involved. So without further ado, let's start our little breakdown. The bad, the CGI. We all remember Alfred Molina covered with tarantulas, or the pit full of snakes, even if half of them were rubber tubes cut in half, or Kate Capshaw getting absolutely covered in insects. But every opportunity that Spielberg has to do something physical or impressive, hops out and goes for the cheap CGI animals instead. There are CGI prairie dogs, CGI scorpions, CGI ants, and yes, you did not make it up in a fever dream. There are indeed a boatload of CGI monkeys in a scene that left everyone in my theater shaking their heads in disbelief that this could actually be happening in an Indiana Jones movie. It's not that the CGI is poorly executed, it's just that it feels wickedly out of place given the crazy stunts we're used to seeing in the series. What the hell is that? And that is, of course, not even mentioning one of the single fucking dumbest moments I have ever seen in a movie theater in my entire life. There's a reason the phrase nuke the fridge has mostly overtaken jump the shark in my personal vocabulary, because this was the single moment that made me realize that this movie was going to be a disappointment, which seemed almost beyond consideration before I walked into the theater. The good, Kate Blanchett. Because 10 years ago, you were part of the team that examined it. Keep it tight. It's hard to dislike Kate Blanchett in just about anything, and Blanchett here seems to be perfectly well aware of how this movie basically mocks the films that have come before it. Whereas a movie like Temple of Doom called for an actually scary villain in Mola Ram, Crystal Skull is so ridiculous that Indy's antagonist needs to be equally ridiculous. But now this next level of weapon is ours to have. Yours to fear. And Blanchett's turn as the psychic, sword-wielding, scenery-chewing Arena Spalco often makes her seem like a more interesting character than Jones himself. It's a performance that's so over the top that you can't even look down and see the top anymore. And it's also a perfect antidote to some of the more saccharine moments that the screen artists throw in. Like most indie movies, we don't wind up learning as much about the villain as we'd like. And in Arena Spalco's case, that seems like a shame. The bad, the script. Power over the mind of men. Be careful. You might get exactly what you wish for. I usually do. This movie is not particularly well written, unfortunately, both in terms of its dialogue and in terms of its plotting. Indiana Jones was a character that was well known for his witty quips in the middle of a stressful situation, but here his lines mostly fall flat, without a real memorable saying in the bunch. And that's before you get to the incredibly hokey. Knowledge is their treasure. 
moral of the story at the end. Instead of any real wit, we're left with Harrison Ford mugging at the camera, attempting to react to CGI creatures and events that really aren't all that amusing. That's bad enough, but the plot is almost as convoluted as what Lucas managed to cook up for Attack of the Clones. So there are conquistadors, and they found a skull, and then Oxley found it too, and then tried to take it back to where it came from, but then he took it back to the conquistadors, and it's kind of psychic, but only for certain people, and it's also magnetic, even though they would have made life really goddamn difficult for an alien. And even though the aliens can open up portals to other dimensions, they have a spaceship anyway. What is going on in this movie? It, it just steps away from the simplicity of the older films and Indy's chase for an important artifact, and it winds up being awfully confusing for it. What are you looking at, Daddy-o? She's getting away! The good Karen Allen. Well, I specifically told you not no, you didn't. to come Mary here yourself. Your you never wrote that? Mother. You never said that in any phone calls? Now, Karen Allen had a respectable career after Raiders of the Lost Ark, with some nice performances in movies like Starman and Scrooge. But she'd been out of the game for a number of years before returning for Chris the Skull. A, a damn good life. Well, that's fine. A damn good, really good life. The movie might not be great, and even though including Mary and Ravenwood in it might have been something of a cheap attempt to earn nostalgia points, Alan seems to have had the most fun making it of anyone in the cast. Baby. She's got a great grin that she flashes more or less every time she's on screen with Indy, at least when they're not screaming at each other. And even if she isn't given much to do beyond driving a car around, the wedding scene at the end of the film should be enough to bring a smile to any Indy fan's face. The bad blur o -rama. I don't really know much about cinematography, but holy shit, does this movie ever look weird? The level of blurry bloom that seems to pervade almost every shot makes it seem as though Spielberg had just got done playing Half-Life 2 for the first time and decided to make his movie look like a video game. Everything seems to have been shot through a haze of vast. The older films on the series had a crisp look to their photography that helped sell the realism of the stunts and sets. But Spielberg threw most of that out the window in favor of a look that might as well be called concentrated nostalgia. Why don't you stick around, Junior? It exaggerates the often awkward implementation of the CGI in the film and winds up being a pretty big distraction throughout. I want to know. Tell me. You know, I haven't even mentioned other annoying aspects of the film, like, say, Shia LaBeouf, who I will do horrible things to if Spielberg and Lucas ever try to make him the eventual star of these films. They hint at that in the movie's finale with the whole hat thing, but wisely, for their sakes, pulled back from the implication that the torch would be passed his way. Even with that small comfort, the rest of this film just doesn't feel like an Indiana Jones movie. It's super competent and at times mildly exciting, but it really feels like the creative team lost sight of what made the original film so entertaining and instead decided to make a bloated $200 million continuation of a franchise that, in retrospect, was better off left alone. There's plenty of ways this movie could have been made and made well, but apparently that would have required that Lucas, Spielberg, and Harrison Ford not be involved. Far from an unwatchable movie, but it's also a surprisingly charmless film and easily described as half good. <laughs> and with that verdict rendered, that'll do it for this edition of Half Good. Join us here on Screen.com again soon for another look at a movie that didn't quite live up to expectations. We'll see you then.